If you're 80, dude, you're a tough guy. Last Sunday, we had a birthday party for Stella. You know how much she turned? 100. 100. She beats all the Bible scores. <laughs> Seriously. But hey, I am about to turn 35. Some, some, some are going... <laughs> no, you don't applaud to that. Come on. It's half... <laughs> okay. <laughs> half, halfway through the four decades of my life. That's halfway through. Hey, if I don't eat well, it's literally halfway through. And I don't want it to be halfway through. <laughs> no, I, I, I barely started. I'm barely getting my kick start now. And I look back, I see a whole bunch of things. I look up front, I hope to see so many things. But the thing is, it happened so fast. Literally, when I close my eyes and listen to this song, I remember when I was 14, I wasn't a Christian yet, I didn't believe in God yet. I got a book in my hand, it was Hobbit, that was 1991, winter 1991, now this is old, <laughs> and uh, I'm reading the book and that's the first, actually first fantasy book that I ever read, growing up in atheistic society kind of tends to shape your mind in a different way. But I read that book and I looked at my life at the age of 14. I looked at my life and I realized, man, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to high school. I want to get a good degree. I'm, a, I'm already a good student. I'm going to go through college. I'm going to get a good job. I'm going to get a good wife. I'm going to have a good family. And I can see the rest of my life. And I'm only 14. And that really made me sad. Because I realized my life is going to be boring if I can already predict what's going to happen. <laughs> and can't we do the same sometimes with our lives? Look at your life. Look at the plans you have. Look at the way the life goes. Just the idea of paying off a house for 30 years makes you realize that my life is pretty predictable. There is a story about a uh, World War I soldier traveling in train uh, with his superior officer. And uh, they got into the, into the place where they, they took their seats and across them there was a young lady sitting with them with her grandma next to her. And you know, soldiers in World War I, that was tough. Actually, even now soldiers tend to pick up girls pretty well. But, uh, so, he's looking at her and she's looking at him, and now both his officer and his grandma, they notice that something is happening, so they're like, ah, oh, okay, kids, yeah, sure, they can play. So, uh, they can wink at each other. So, the, the tunnel is coming close, and now soldier sees the tunnel coming, and those days, those trains were slow, and uh, they didn't have electricity in the trains, and when you get in the tunnel, it gets dark. So they get in the tunnel and it's complete darkness, suddenly cut off from light, and you hear the smack of a kiss, and then you hear a slap. <laughs> and uh, as they're going through the tunnel, the girl is thinking, man, I'm so glad this soldier kissed me, but my grandma shouldn't slap him that hard. <laughs> so the grandma is thinking, man, it's really nice that she kissed him, but why did she slap him? And his superior officer says, well, it's really brave from him to kiss the girl, but why did she miss him and hit me? <laughs> so they're out of the tunnel, tunnel, going into the sunset, and the soldier can't get his smile off. He managed to kiss a girl, slap his superior officer, and get away with it. Taking every single advantage of life. Every single breath counts. Every single opportunity is there to be used and built into something awesome. Amen. Unfortunately, many times we get caught up in the everyday. 
You know how it works. You know how it happens. We got deadlines, we have commitments, we have problems, we have priorities, we have distractions, we have kids, we have work, we have uh, issues, we have this, we have that. And by the time you turn around, you realize, wow, my day is gone. Wow, my week is gone. Wow, this year is gone. Where did it go? Living life to the fullest is one of the things that everybody wants. And I bet that if I asked you, would you like to live your life to the fullest? Would you like to be the best, best painter ever? Would you like to be the best builder ever? Would you like to live in the awesomest place that you ever dream about? Everybody wants that. Everybody wants to fulfill their life completely and to sit down at the end and say, just as Abraham did, Man, this was an awesome ride. But then, you never hear anybody say, you know what, I'll just like to get by as, as, how I can, and I'll just like to leave this world in peace. People who say that usually gave up already, and you don't find too many of them. Even them just don't have the strength to carry on, but they would love to if they could. The only time I hear that is from high schoolers when they talk about school. I just want to sit through it quietly while it goes away. <laughs> but when they talk about life, they want a grand life. And they have huge plans. Just remember your teenage days. How did you think about life? Expectations, plans. One thing that the Bible says, and Bible is very optimistic about this grand life, is that no matter how old or how young you are, no matter how many, uh, bag, how much baggage you have on your back, no matter how hurt, wounded you are, God can give you that grand life. Amen. And there is a way how to achieve that. That's what I want us to think about today. The reason why we play this song is because anytime I hear that song, it just reminds me of, my, of what I told you at the beginning. And, and the song is actually very depressive and very sad and very pessimistic. But it's true, on the other hand. That's why it touches us, because it's true. Now, the Bible tells us something else. In Philippians, in chapter 3, verses 7 to 16, Paul describes... Something really interesting. You don't have to put it on the... Sorry. Uh, yet. Uh, before you focus on reading the verse, I want you just to focus on this. Who was Paul? What do we know about Paul? We know about Paul that he was a successful guy. He achieved in life... And everything that he wanted, he was a role model for young Pharisees over there. He had an education. He had a Roman citizenship. He was powerful. He was devoted. He achieved things that other people couldn't. They would look at Paul and they were like, man, I want to be like this guy. This is a Pharisee, first class Pharisee, top of the line. This is the copy paste I want for my son. This is... The guy I'd love to marry. This is a role model of our society. So Paul was awesome. And the best thing about it, he was perfectly happy and content with his life. Bible says that with fire in his heart, he was doing what he was doing for God. Yeah, it wasn't really that great. Killing, murdering people, splitting families, committing genocide. It's actually pretty disturbing, the things that he did. But he did it with his full heart, believing that he serves his purpose, that he serves God. And then everything changed. Have you ever compared butter? And I can't believe it's not butter. <laughs> did anybody, you, somebody tried. Okay, I'm not the only one. So I'm not the weirdo here. <laughs> but I had to try it. Even, and honestly, yeah, after you, after you try it side by side, you actually can't believe it's not butter. Uh, Paul was eating, I can't believe it's not butter, all of his life. And now suddenly, in a splash, he tastes butter. Let's read some of the verses. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. Listen to this. 
the very credentials these people are waving around as something special. He's talking about the Pharisees and about everything he had. I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash along with everything else I used to take credit for. Imagine that. All of the life, everything he had, everything he was, suddenly it's trash. And why? Because of butter. Because of the real thing. He achieved in life everything most of us dreams of. And then he finds butter. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life. Compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master firsthand, everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. Dog dung. And Bible literally says this. A lot of translations are going to try to make it cute, but he says dog crap. That's what his life seemed to him after he experienced the real butter. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I could embrace Christ and be embraced by him. And that's not all. Look at this. He's moving on. He says, I didn't want some petty inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules. When I could get a robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. He was perfect. He was awesome. He completely obeyed all of the rules. Everything. And then he says, he looks at the butter and he's like, I am so ridiculous. I'm so underdressed. I'm going to go behind and just cry in the dark. That's how he acts. That's how he sees himself when he meets Christ. I gave up all that. And look at this, inferior stuff. He invested his life in that stuff. And now suddenly that's inferior. So I could know Christ personally. Experience his resurrection power. Be a partner in his suffering. And go all the way with him to death itself. If there was any way to get in on the resurrection from the dead, I wanted to do it. There are three steps that Paul talks about that changed his perspective, that changed his life, and that actually everything that he considered life to be upgraded to a completely different level. Three things that he talks about here. And first one is, he mentioned at the beginning, a purpose. Finding a purpose. Now, uh, if I asked you, uh, what is your purpose in life? I, I kind of talked a little bit to some people about that, and I made a, a list of it. And a lot of people say, I just want to be a great wife, to take care of my kids, to raise them well. Some will say, I want to be the best worker ever in uh, my field of work where I'm working. Some are going to say, I want to be a good teacher, nurse, mechanic, whatever you are. Uh, I want to be a better kid. I annoy my parents too much. I, one of the kids actually said that. <laughs> but uh, there is a purpose in life that pushes us, that drives us to do things. Because we want to raise our life to a higher level of existence, better quality of life. And everything that I mentioned fits into that. But that is not the question that Paul asks. This is the question that he asks you right now. <laughs> What is the purpose of your life? Why are you around? And then the toughest one. Is your life worth living? Let's do an experiment. I need two volunteers who can draw. I need somebody. No, I don't want stick figure, guys. I want somebody who can actually draw. Come on. I know Chris. OK, somebody else. One more person. Come on. Uh, don't make me pick you and embarrass you. So <laughs> who can draw? Come on, anybody. Wilson. Oh, you're just running away. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Sue, come on. 
Your daughter embarrassed you right now. Okay, no, 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 you don't touch anything. You don't touch now. Who told you to touch anything? You have to listen to me. Okay, give me this pen. See, those teenagers. Okay, we have two stands, two pieces of paper. You want a taller stand, okay. It's easier for you to bend. Okay, we have a fancy Parker pen. I got it from uh, one good friend of mine. Unfortunately, he passed last week, last yeah, last year, and uh, it's really dear to me. Uh, I don't know how much it costed, but uh, it's a nice Parker pen. And then over here, I have nice, made in China, chewed on pen. <laughs> Be careful where you hold it. Okay. <laughs> and here's the deal. I'll give you 30 seconds to draw me. Yeah. Three, two, one, go. 25. 20. 15. Come on. Come on. It's a nice Parker pen. Come on. 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, three, one. Okay, let's see the job. Are you serious? <laughs> okay, I, I need a haircut. <laughs> that doesn't write. Why did you scratch in the paper? Yeah. <laughs> okay, we have. Thank you very much, guys. We have a scary me with square eyes and bad haircut. And then we have a scratched piece of paper. Now, if you were to do something important in your life and you need a pen, which one would you choose? The cheap, the cheap chewed pen I found in the parking lot did the job. And the fancy Parker one didn't. Why? What is the purpose of a pen? To look nice? To be fancy? To be emotionally attached to somebody? No. The purpose of a pen is to write. And we can do so many things with our life. We can achieve so much. We can be the fanciest Parker pen ever, and yet to miss to fulfill our purpose. That's why you will see a lot of successful rich people in their last days regretting, for they didn't do things in their life the way they should have. What is the purpose of life? Here's how Paul describes purpose. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. We already read them, but let's go through that again. I gave up all that inferior stuff so I could know Christ personally, experience his resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering, and go all the way with him to death itself. If there was any way to get in the resurrection of the dead, I wanted to do it. The purpose in our life is to know God. You may disagree, you may don't like it, but it's very simple and easy. I'm not going to do another experiment because it's not my phone. But what happens if I let the phone, if I, if I just let it go? Bob, <laughs> it's your phone, you tell me. <laughs> okay. So, okay, there is more consequences than just breaking the phone. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> the law of gravity tells us that anything that is not connected to the earth is going to be attracted to it. 
That's why we are careful with fragile stuff. Don't drop them because they will break down. This is the law of spiritual physics. The purpose that was weaved into our beings long time ago when Jesus made Adam and Eve was to know God. To be part of Him. To spend life living with Him. To be His friends. To be His brothers and sisters. Amen. That is our purpose. Now, misunderstanding this can lead you to be an awesome Christian for all of, all of your life and be very uncontent with your spirituality. Because people, as we are, we like to be free. We don't want to be forced and tied to something. But we are already tied. Just example the gravity. I mean, you can defy gravity as much as you want. Eventually, you'll end up on the ground. You can defy it forever. Because we don't have that in ourselves. We are tied to these laws. It's the same with the laws of spiritual nature. Understand our purpose. Now, when you understand our purpose, then you can focus on achieving it. How many of you play golf? Only a few. Okay. Uh, I don't, just so, don't. <laughs> I'm not a golf guy. But you guys who play golf, you know how hard uh, sometimes it can be to play that game. And I saw a bumper sticker, I hate golf, I hate golf, I get golf. Nice shot, I love golf. Uh, President Ulysses Grant was about to be introduced to the game of golf by Friedrich Kotzman, one of the pioneers in this game. So they were on a nice field, and there was president with uh, all of his entourage, and Scotsman puts the that uh, whatever in the ground. <laughs> he puts the ball there, so he gets ready. He swings, and suddenly the splash of grass and uh, dirt gets into President Grant's beard, so he cleans it out. But he's patient, he's okay. So Scotsman's like nervous, you know, <laughs> hey, you're presenting it to the president. He swings again and again and again. And then after the sixth time, President Grant cautiously notices there seems to be a fair amount of exercise in this game, but I just fail to see the purpose of a ball. <laughs> Where is the ball in your life? Are you hitting and missing with everything you do? Did you hit that ball as strong as you could? Or you're just looking nice with that, with that thing, club? <laughs> I'll need to take a crash course in golf lesson. <laughs> there seems to be a fair amount of exercise in our lives. But sometimes, we just fail to see the purpose. The main reason why is because people are trying to find purpose in wrong places. Like it or not, our purpose is in life with God. Amen. The more you push your purpose on the side, less content with your life you will be. The more you invest and work to achieve that purpose, the greater feeling of contentment Amen. are going to fill you up. I went through that. I know that some of you did too. Some of you might be going through that. Some of you might try next week. But I encourage you to understand one thing. There is enormous difference between life and existence. Webster Dictionary uh, defines life as a vigorous, alive, and just full of living. On the other hand, existence, existing is defined as to have been. There is a big amount of difference in between those two. So many of us are just existing. You know that, you know that routine, you wake up, you prepare food, you eat, you sit in your car, you drive to work, get stuck in traffic, late, usual day, you make phone calls, you answer emails, you 
uh, go home, it's already five, six o'clock, you're tired, you might go out, buy something, sit, watch TV. Okay, it's time for bed. And then tomorrow, same thing. And then same thing. And then same thing. Now, that is the life we have to live. Because it's just the way the society works. You can, I mean, you could, but you can't really just wake up one morning, burn down your kitchen, sit in your car, drive on the left side of the road and go to Hawaii. <laughs> Theoretically, you could. You probably wouldn't get there. But where is that going to bring you? It's going to just bring you more troubles. We live in a society where rules exist and we have to abide by those rules in order to have a normal and successful life. But the problem is when that normal and successful life becomes a burden and becomes just a waste of time because we are not getting content with it. Accepting our true purpose will give a sense to everything we do every single day. Waking up with God in the midst of battle with cancer is much easier than waking up without Him and being alive and well. Waking up with God after you just lost a loved one is much easier than waking up with your family and without God. Believe it or not, that's how it is. The only way to know for sure is for you to try. Let's go on. That was step one. There is, there is two more things that Paul talks about. Very important. Second step to accept. Philippians 3 verse 14. Very short, very easy, very simple. I'm off and running, and I am not turning back. <laughs> Why doesn't Paul look back? What would you say? Put yourself for two seconds in his shoes and tell me why he doesn't want to look back. Well, there are things to look back to, but what are the things that he is going to look back to? The same routine, same old thing. <laughs> Errors, routine. He looks back and see whole, he sees the trail of blood behind him that he left from killing all of those people. He sees crying children left without their parents. He sees devastation and pain that he caused. Yeah, I, I honestly, if I was a war criminal, I wouldn't look back either. And he was a criminal, big time criminal. But every one of us has dark pages of our history, don't we? Every one of us can look back and say, man, I'm so ashamed of that. I so need to ask for forgiveness, but I can't even approach them anymore. I, I, I was a bad person. I made some bad choices. <laughs> when I was a kid, I remember one soccer game. Uh, it was too small for the world, but big for me at that time. My uncle was playing. It was a major league in Serbia, that Yugoslavia. And uh, they had one player. He was young, but he was like really good. And uh, they would usually put him uh, at the end of the second half so he can score. This time, coach decided to let him play the whole game. That's 90 minutes of running. Uh, so they start playing. And uh, he's all confused when he gets in. At first, everybody sees that he's confused. But the combination of his confusion happened when he got the ball and he started running in the wrong direction. And just imagine, like a few thousand people around you, everybody else. Not that way. Not that way. So he stops, he's confused, he loses the ball. And because he was close to his goal instead of the opponent's one, the opponent's score. Half time of the game, they're sitting in there. Now my uncle tells me, because he was sitting in there, he says everybody's quiet. Usually they talk, yell, whatever. Usually the coach gives them the pep, pep talk. This time everybody was just quiet because really everybody counted on him and he screwed up. Like he couldn't screw up worse. So coach is like, okay guys, let's go back. And he's sitting in there 
and the uh, coach tells him, come on, you too, you'll be first on the field. He's like, I can't play, look what I did. And then the coach tells him something, I remember that because it was, because my uncle remembered that, but he said, the coach tells him, hey guy, it's only a half time, there is half more game left. There is half more game left. Even it's only one day of our life left. There is hope for everybody. That's why Paul doesn't look back. Whatever happened can be fixed, can be, can be redone. But what we can do, we can choose not to identify ourselves with what we used to be, but to identify ourselves with what we are right now in Christ, with our purpose. That's the beauty of being a Christian. <sighs> let it go because God let it go. Don't mock his forgiveness by clinging to those bad things back there. But that's not all, not just the bad things. How many of you were, were forced to listen to the story of a good old days? <laughs> oh, when I was oh, your, your age. Oh, those were the days. We walked to school uphill back and forth and stuff like that. But those were the good old days. How many of you listen to Bruce Springsteen? Okay, nobody above age of 40, I think, raised a hand. <laughs> but uh, when I was a kid, my dad, my dad has those long plates, those big ones. He had a turntable. And I remember when I was a kid, I would spread my arms and I couldn't reach how many, the, the collection that he had. He had Bruce Springsteen, he used to listen to it. And uh, I didn't understand the songs that time, but I know the songs. So when we moved here to the States, my English got better. And I'm like, ah, that's what he's saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> there is one song of Bruce Springsteen, uh, it's called The Glory Days. I don't know if you remember the song about that guy who always sings about high school and good old glory days. And then he wraps up with a song. He says, time slips away and leaves you with nothing but boring stories of glory days. Yeah, it was awesome. I get it. But it was. And it's never going to happen again. What is supposed to happen is that you will make today better in those glory days back there. Yeah, you were younger. Yeah, you had more strength. Yeah, you were more stupid. You did things that you probably wouldn't do right now. But that doesn't justify your clinging to some good old days over there in the back. Forget about past. We have today to look forward to. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Beautiful verses. Let's keep focused on that goal. Those of us who want everything God has for us, if any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, God will clear your bl bl sorry, blurred vision. You'll see it yet. Now that we're on the right track, let's stay on it. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Okay, this part is very important. I want everybody, if you're sleeping, if you're whatever you're doing, wake up. I want you to focus on this second paragraph that is on the screen. Because this brought me peace. And I want you to find it too. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. Look at this. Shape your worries into prayers. Before you know it, a sense of God wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come and settle you down. It's so wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life life. Last year, Jasmine and I got our green cards. It was March 24. I was in the post office sending uh, books for the, for the direct TV program. Jasmine was waking, waiting in the car, an attorney is calling me, 
and I'm next in the line and I tell her, hey, I can't talk to you right now. She says, oh, yes, you can. <laughs> and she's just to let you know you guys are approved. So, you know, you're standing in the post office line and everybody is serious. And I start smiling like crazy and laughing. People are like, are you high? <laughs> like, you bet I'm high. So, since I'm in the line, I get over there and I can't get it off of my face. I send Jasmine a text. Hey, just so you know, what happened? Moment, second, she's calling me. <laughs> and then, then she tells Gordon what happened. And we're over there on the, uh, on the eighth second in Wadsworth. And Gordon is driving and he says, oh, I'll be there in a few minutes. So Gordon gets out of the car and he's all like. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized. God didn't bring me as much happiness as a green card. <laughs> and then I realized how sad occasion that actually was. I should have had that peace. Not waiting for a green card. Not waiting for some future to happen with green card. Yeah, now we have a lot of things to do. And we are doing a lot of things. And life is going to be awesome. But that's not the point. And I realized that I was wrong all that time, waiting for a future to happen, being stressed out with where it's going to end up, how it's going to be. And I was just distracted from life. I was existing for quite a long period of time until we got those green cards. I believe God answered our prayer because make the long story short, it was very, very strange how we got those green cards. And I believe that God blessed us with that. But the fact was, I wasn't supposed to rely on that. I was supposed to be relied on the third step that Paul insists on so manically. Embrace your present. It's today that counts. Tomorrow's going to happen. Yesterday has passed. Today is present. It's a gift. That's why it's called present. If you watch Kung Fu Panda, you know what I'm talking about. But Paul didn't worry about future. He says, I'm going with Christ to my death. He looks at the end of his life. And he doesn't contemplate what's going to happen in between. He just sees Christ over there at the end. And remember, how did he end up? He ended up in jail. He was rotting there for a long time. And then he was killed. And he could have had an awesome life. But <laughs> he drained the last drop of life of every minute he had. Why? Because he found his purpose. He left the past behind. And then he focused on today with God. Not with green card. Not with good job. Not with awesome family. Not with expensive car. Not with your gold and guns and whatever Americans love. I love it too, don't get me wrong. I'm getting a gun as soon as I can. <laughs> but, but that's not what is supposed to keep us safe and content. Because we know what the Bible says about the last days. That the last days will just be a repetition of uh, the persecution that Christians experience for their faith. And in those last days, the only thing that will protect us is our faith. Our God that we spent every day with. And then it's interesting how Jesus says in that last day. I will come down and many will yell. Oh Lord, oh Lord, here we are. Take us up. We preached in your name. We did miracles in your name. We were so awesome in your name. And he will say, do I really know you? Excuse me. But I know you. If he knows me 
today, right now, if I am here standing with him today, if I woke up with him today, if I move through my life and put him first, he will add up everything. Give an hour of your day to God, he will add up three more hours to your day. I went through that, especially in college, I remember that. He will add up everything if you just decide to put him first. Amen. Let's wrap this up. I was talking too long already. You remember the story written in John 11 about uh, Lazarus and uh, Martha and Mary, Mary sisters, what happened? What happened to Lazarus in chapter 11? He died and then he rose again. You guys need to read the Bible more. <laughs> you were very, everybody was like, uh, he, he died. <laughs> Just read chapter 11, it's awesome. Anyways, Jesus gets the message that Lazarus died. So he decides to spend three more days away from that place just to make sure that all the superstition is already passed and Lazarus is dead dead. Not alive dead, but dead dead. So he gets over there and he is welcomed with strange words. Martha sees Jesus, she runs to him and she doesn't say, she doesn't hug him, she doesn't cry, she doesn't, the only thing that she says, she says, Master, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And even though I know that whatever you ask God, he will give you. So, what does Martha show? Martha shows, believe that Jesus would be able to save her brother if he was here. Now, we read the Bible. If you believe in God, I would assume that you believe that Jesus really did all of that stuff that the Bible talks about. Now, Jesus simply replies to her. Jesus said, your brother will be raised up. And now Martha again shows her faith. Martha replied, I know that he will be raised up in the resurrection at the end of time. So, she believes that Jesus, that everything that Jesus did in the past, he's able to do. And she believes that in the future, when that time comes, Jesus will be able to get him from the dead. She believes that Jesus is capable of doing that before and after. But what Jesus wants her to believe is that he can do it now. Do you believe that he can do it now in your life, in your struggles, with your shortcomings, with your issues? We have no doubt that he, will, that he did that stuff. We have no doubt that he will do it at the end of time. But if we have doubts that he is going to provide for you today with whatever is burdening you so much. If you have issues with that, then it's time for you to stop, click the pause button on your life and decide what are you going to do next when you get home. There are two options. You can move on with your life and hope for the best. Or you can decide to devote your best time of every day to Him and see what happens. Martha's brother was dead. There was nothing worse. But even though he was dead, that was not the end. Guys, the only thing left to us to do, and I'll finish with this verse, and this will be the last one. We will read it. I want you to remember it. Take it home. Take it with you. And don't let this sermon just sit on the back shelf of your mind. This is not something that I just shared with you. I poured out my life in this sermon because I know how much of my life was changed because of the things I shared with you. And I know how much your life is going to be changed if you give it a chance. Last verses of the day. 
Stick with me, friends. Keep track of those you see running the same course headed for the same goal. There are many out there talking other paths, choosing other goals, and trying to get you to go along with them. I've warned you of them many times. Sadly, I haven't, I'm having to do it again. And I'm warning you guys right now to think about this. All they want is easy street. They hate Christ's cross. But easy street is a dead end street. Those who live there make their bellies their gods, belches or their prayers, praise. All they can think of is their appetites. But there is far more to life for us. We're citizens of high heaven. We're waiting for arrival. We're waiting the arrival of the Savior, the Master, Jesus Christ, who will transform our earthly bodies into glorious bodies like His own. Amen. He'll make us beautiful and whole with the same powerful skill by which He is putting everything as it should be under and around Him. Our whole life will be put in place. And it's right there. It's a prayer away. It's, it's a little bit of dedication away. We are right there. All you have to do is ask. I encourage you to do that this week. Accept your purpose that Bible gives us. Forget the bad and good and everything. And focus on today. Give today the best shot you can with God. Oh my, he's going to make your life awesome. Let's sing one more song before we finish up.